All right, now we'd like to welcome Professor Raja Gutkarta from UC Santa Cruz. Thank you. And we'll switch topics just a little bit. Um, he'll be speaking about galaxies and cannibalism, and we'll see here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Back? Yeah. Right, thank you. All right, let me. A long time ago, in a <laughs> fruit fly, far, far away. Wait, that's the wrong talk. Um, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, um, we're going to make a transition from the teensy weensy things Mila talked about to some very large objects. And um, I'm going to talk about galaxies. And I'm going to talk about the dark matter that binds them. This is going to sound like Lord of the Rings, but um, <laughs> the same dark matter that causes them to cannibalize other galaxies. The only kind of cannibalism I'm going to talk about involves galaxies, not humans. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how the periodic table of elements, something that Thora referred to, these elements that were, or I think Patrick, you referred to this, the elements found in the moon. I'm going to talk about how these came to be. I'm not going to have time to talk about how young people, high school students, participate in some of the research um, I'm going to talk about today, but if you ask me afterwards. Um, this is something I'm very interested in. I've been talking to David and Laura about the school program here at Griffith and what synergy there, there might exist in between these programs. So I work on galaxies, and you're probably wondering, wow, that's oddly specific. You know, why does he work only on galaxies? Why not planets? stars, black holes, you know, there's so many other cool things in the universe. And I will argue that there aren't any cooler things in the universe than galaxies. Um, here, here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so, galaxies are important because what, if you, th because they're basic building blocks of the, of the universe. Just like atoms are basic building blocks of matter, galaxies are basic building blocks of the cosmos. And you know, this looks like a, one of these SAT analogy things where <laughs> atoms to the, the atoms are not, the atoms are not the biggest or smallest building blocks of, the, of matter. Uh, the floorboards over here or the granite blocks that make up this building, they're bigger building blocks. And certainly there are particles that are much smaller than atoms. Electrons and protons are smaller. Quarks are even smaller than, than protons. They're not the smallest nor the largest building blocks, but they're the most important because the discovery of the processes that bind atoms together, the physics of atoms led to huge advances in, uh, in, in understanding of the structure of matter itself. In the same way, galaxies are not the smallest or biggest building blocks, but they're really important because if it weren't for the fact that we are part of a galaxy, part of a large galaxy actually, we wouldn't have complex life here on Earth. All space considered would be a far less interesting show because <laughs> you know, you'd be made of hydrogen and helium, you know, so would all of us, and you know, life would be far less interesting. So, so I want to uh, explain a little bit uh, more about, I want to back up this statement by talking a little bit about the, the evidence, the, the line of logic that leads us to, uh, this, um, to believe that uh, we really needed to be part of a big galaxy to be the way we are as complex human beings. So I'm going to talk about uh, our place in the cosmos. And when I say our, you could imagine your picture up there. Uh, I'm going to imagine my son uh, reclining on the carpet there. There he is. Um, <laughs> so my story applies to humans, but it also applies to dogs, cats, it applies to the simplest living things we can think of, the simplest virus or bacteria to the most complex mammals. What is common to them is our biology is heavily reliant on complex molecules. Molecules like proteins, molecules like DNA, RNA, these are many hundreds if not thousands of atoms uh, strung together or connected together, not strung together, connected together into these complex molecules. Uh, I would argue that the complexity of these molecules is directly related to the complexity, diversity, and richness of life on Earth, of the form and function of life on Earth. Uh, you really couldn't build complex things, 
complex living things or complex anything, if you just had uh, you know, simple molecules uh, to work with, if you just had molecules like water or carbon dioxide to work with. Now, to form complex molecules like this, you need to have atoms that can form multiple chemical bonds. See, hydrogen has one electron. It's like a one-armed atom. It can hold another atom. That's all it can do. So it can form the end of a molecular chain, but it can't be a central entity in a complex atom. Helium has two electrons, two arms, but it doesn't like to use its arms at all. It's inert. It doesn't like to hold any hands. Um, so, you know, with hydrogen and helium, we'd really be sunk. Uh, lithium has three electrons. Beryllium has four. You know, but it starts to get interesting when you get up to things like carbon, you know, six electrons. Nitrogen has seven. Oxygen has Oxygen has eight. Now these are these multi-armed atoms that can form the centers or can form key nodes in these complex molecules. So we refer to life as carbon-based life for these, these sorts of reasons. Now you don't need to look very far to find these elements. If you look on the earth, you can find carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. You know, if you're wearing a diamond ring, if you're lucky enough to be wearing a diamond ring, you're you know, carrying carbon around. Um, if you're breathing, which I hope you are, you're taking in nitrogen and oxygen all the time. Um, you know, barbecue grill, you know, swimming in the ocean. These are ways in which we experience these elements all the time. These are key components of large molecules, large complex molecules. So if you want to understand the origin of life, you have to understand the origin of elements like these. And um, Early on, people wondered whether our parent star, the sun, is capable of producing these large complex atoms through nuclear fusion reactions. You know, this, is a, this was an important question early on. And um, do people know the answer to this question? How many yeses do we have in the house? How many noes? How many maybes? And OK, how about let's start with Maybe. No, let's start with let's start <laughs> let's start with no. Can we have a show of hands for the answer is no. Okay, how about yeses? Okay? How about I have no idea what you're talking about. No. All right, sorry. No. Okay. No. Okay. So the answer is no. The the sun is uh, undergoing fusion reactions, but it's only doing one very boring reaction, which is it's converting hydrogen to helium. In fact, helium was discovered in the sun and the Name helium comes from the Greek word for the sun, helios. So the sun has been converting hydrogen to helium, the first element of the periodic table to the second element, and it's been doing this for the entire four and a half billion years of its existence. So the sun is a very boring cook. <laughs> it's been one recipe, hydrogen to helium. It's, been, it's a very slow cook. It's been doing this for four and a half billion years. Now, so um, how, you know, how did we get to the point where, um, you know, how, how is, why does the Earth have these elements? In fact, why does the Sun have all these elements? The Sun has all of the elements that you see in the periodic table. Uh, you know, those were discovered here on Earth, but they're also present in the Sun. And the answer is because they're part of our inheritance. The Earth and Sun were born out of a cloud like this. This is an actual picture of a nebula. But the Earth and Sun were born out of clouds like this that already contained these elements in the periodic table. So they're part of our inheritance. Now, if you're thinking like a scientist, it's not enough to be told you have this wealth because you were born with it. Uh, that's not a good answer because you want to find out how your ancestors garnered this wealth. So in an astronomical context, we want to find out how this nebula came to have all these key elements in the periodic table. And we have to look to the ancestors of the sun. Ancestors, what I mean by that, stars that lived and died before the sun and earth came into being. What you're seeing here is a picture of a star field in the, in the Milky Way galaxy that contains a variety of stars. You see, um, you see stars of different colors. The red stars are the coolest, only in a temperature sense, because the sun, after all, is the coolest star in the universe. But uh, <laughs> the red stars are, have temperatures of two, 3,000 Kelvin. The sun is 6,000. And the bluish-white stars have temperatures of 10, 20,000 Kelvin. These bluish white stars burn very hot, they're very massive, and compared to the sun, they're much more, they're much more rapid as cooks, they're much more versatile as cooks. So what they can do in, in a matter of a billion years or even 100 million years or less, they can cook through fusion reactions, they can cook through the first 26 elements of the periodic table. Hydrogen to helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, 
don't worry, I'm not going to go up to the 26, I can't. <laughs> but um, but 20, the 26 element is iron, Fe. It can cook all those elements in its interior. So the, these massive stars are more versatile cooks and they're more rapid cooks. And very importantly, they're very generous cooks. At the ends of their lives, they explode. <laughs> so uh, these things that they cooked are distributed through the surroundings. And they, they turn into, uh, into these spectacular explosions called supernovae. You, you're going to see one appear here. This is a picture of an actual supernova taken about a 1,000 years after the explosion. Now, this explosion has this wonderful effect of dispersal, disperses these elements through the surroundings into these clouds of gas and dust out of which new stars are born. But there's another very important aspect to this explosion. These explosions are so energetic that even endothermic nuclear fusion reactions, things that are energy eating, even those reactions take place because there's just so much energy available. So elements that are above iron in the periodic table, all the elements we know of in the periodic table are produced during these explosions, especially the ones above iron that cannot be produced during the lifetime of a star are produced during the explosive death of massive stars. So important for two reasons. Again, the production of elements heavier than uh, iron, so above 26 in terms of atomic number, and the dispersal of elements. Now, there's one bad thing about an explosion. So much energy that if you're a small galaxy, that explosion can take these uh, wonderful elements and clear, kick them out of the galaxy. So one of the things we've done, this is work with some of my later PhD students after David, Evan Kirby's work in particular, he's at Caltech, uh, is if you look at small galaxies, small in size, small in mass, their gravity is so weak that these exploding stars um, eject the material completely from the galaxy. The galaxy doesn't benefit from having hosted these stars. So the next generation isn't the beneficiary of the elements produced in the previous generation. So what we see is these low mass galaxies are much more anemic in terms of their periodic table of elements content compared to stars in the Milky Way. So we not only had to be part of a family of stars, in order to be complex life forms today, we had to be part of a very large family of stars with lots of dark matter to hold back, to bring back the explosion of supernovae. The supernovae um, are not energetic enough to, uh, to completely escape from our galaxy. The material rains back in. And so here's a picture of a large galaxy. This is not the Milky Way galaxy, if you already know this. This is uh, a surrogate, uh, uh, you know, this is a vicarious view of what our galaxy might look like. We don't have a long enough selfie stick, so we can't take <laughs> pictures of this of the Milky Way. So this is our Andromeda galaxy, and um, our view of the Andromeda galaxy um, is uh, very similar to what the Milky Way might look like from Andromeda. So um, this is about 100,000 light years across, 100,000. This isn't the entire galaxy. One of the things we've discovered, starting with David's work, is the Andromeda galaxy is about five times bigger than this picture shows, and five times bigger than people previously thought. So now imagine waking up one day and finding you're five times bigger than you were, uh, <laughs> than, you, than you thought you were. You know, you can't get out of your bedroom door, you're gonna bump into things, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. Not about you getting five times bigger, but about galaxies being five times bigger than people previously thought. So 100,000 light years across, and the other number I'll give you is galaxies like the Andromeda and, and Milky Way galaxy are made up of about 100 billion stars, so one with 11 zeros after it. And um, if this were the Milky Way, we wouldn't be in downtown LA, we wouldn't be way off in, I don't know, Riverside. You know, we'd probably be in a uh, you know, place like Griffith Observatory, you know, somewhere um, not quite in the heart of uh, the galaxy and not quite out in the suburbia. Uh, we are about 25,000 years, um, light years from the center of the Milky Way. And I could lie and tell you there's a lovely picture of the solar system right there. Um, I could, and I wouldn't know it, you wouldn't know it, because the solar system on this scale is tiny. The solar system, the entire solar system, you're talking about new horizons and all of that, is a few hours of light travel time. This picture is 100,000 years of light travel time. So that's why if you had a picture of the solar system in there, um, you'd need a very large magnifying glass to see it. You, know, you, you couldn't really see it easily. Now, you can take pictures of the Milky Way from the inside, and I'm about to show you um, such a picture. This was uh, taken by John Rockman, um, 
physics teacher in Palo Alto. He took a series of images, 30 seconds apart, and stitched them together into a movie of the Milky Way swinging by. The Milky Way appearing to swing by as the Earth rotates. So that's what you're going to see here. So you see this band of gas and dust that appears to sweep across our sky, appears to rotate. And you'll notice that as the movie progresses, you can see clouds, lightning, you can see uh, streaks of shooting stars, you can see trees fluttering, you can see the sky getting darker as we get further and further away from sunset. And you can guess from the fact that the Milky Way started out horizontal, the fact that it's vertical now, this is about a six hour sequence, a little less than six hours, because in six hours, the Milky Way would go from horizontal to vertical and then upside down in another six hours and then vertical again and then back. So it's about, it's a little less than a quarter of a, uh, of a 24 hour cycle. Again, beautiful movie. John Rockman um, um, you know, shared this with me a few years ago. Now, um, so the Milky Way has also been found to be quite a bit larger than people previously thought. Uh, I study the Milky Way now. I use the Keck telescopes a lot to, to study the Milky Way and other galaxies. But I really um, fell in love with galaxies studying the Milky Way's neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. This is the picture you saw earlier. The Andromeda Galaxy is about two and a half million light years away. Uh, it has a couple of companions there that you see in this picture. Uh, the one at 4 o'clock has the romantic name of M32. The one at 12 o'clock is NGC 205. And what we've, what we've studied, and this is again the work of another PhD student, Phil Choi at Pomona College. He used to be a PhD student at Santa Cruz. Has studied how these small galaxies are being ripped by Andromeda. They get ripped because the near end of the galaxy is being pulled harder than the far end, so they stretch out the galaxy. You can actually see the stretching of the upper galaxy if you look closely. You can see this sort of vertical, uh, very faint but vertical band of light through the, through the upper galaxy. To study this galaxy, I use the same telescope that uh, Laura got to use recently. Uh, this is the, uh, the Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea. You'll see them coming into view. This is a, a picture taken by Laurie Hatch, a beautiful Mauna Kea sunset. And um, that telescope on the right is where that man's PhD thesis started mm -hmm. on the 2nd of October, 1996. Uh, I remember it because it was the second day of operation of that telescope. The telescope went into operation on the 1st of October, 1996, and we got to use it on the second day. Um, it, that's 1996 today. I mean, I used the Keck telescope two nights ago on the 29th, or three nights ago on the 29th of uh, January. So I've been using it every few weeks since that time. And it's been painstaking work, but it's been absolutely the most fun I've had uh, doing, uh, doing science. So David was my first PhD student. And um, so it's all, all very special. I wanted to bring this story back to you. Now, the Keck telescopes are expensive, powerful. They're the, arguably the most expensive ground-based telescope. So you'll notice we've carefully put them on top of a volcano. <laughs> in, in, in mm. um, so I, you know, I'm really fortunate to have used it for 20-some you know, years, but who knows? Who knows? Who knows when that'll all come to an end? OK, uh, so I've used these telescopes to study Andromeda, get a detailed view. And one of the things we study is this cannibalism of small galaxies uh, uh, by Andromeda. And I want to give you an idea of what happens when galaxies cannibalize each, uh, each other. The cannibal, cannibalism process of one galaxy where, by another is very slow. It takes a long time. Uh, it takes a few billion years, actually. So we can't watch a single system go through this. It just takes too much time. What we can do instead is see snapshots of different galaxies at different stages of the cannibalism process. The other thing we can do is speed up time on a computer, that is build mock galaxies, let the forces of gravity run, and see what cannibalism does. So that's what I'm going to do uh, next, is show you computer simulations of colliding galaxies. And I'm going to compare them to actual pictures of colliding galaxies. So let's see if this movie works. Um, we start out with two galaxies that are frisbee shaped, and right as they approach each other, uh, right as they approach there, we stop the simulation, and here are two real galaxies that are about to collide. This is an actual pair of galaxies. We go back to the computer simulation, and you see that their gravity brings them closer, and they start intersecting. In fact, they're intersecting at this point, and again, we stop our computer simulation right there, we change our perspective. 
until we get to there. And here are, is a second pair of galaxies that are further along in the collision process. Different pair, not the first pair, second pair. We go back to the computer simulation and you see the stretching I'm talking about. The near end is being pulled harder than the far end. You see the stretching and we stop our computer simulation. Here's a real third pair of galaxies going through the collision process. Uh, the main bodies of the two galaxies start falling back together. This is the computer simulation again. Uh, just before they merge, the central bodies, we stop our computer simulation, change our perspective. And here's a fourth pair of galaxies going through the collision process. Now, the, you know, the simulations are, of course, designed to mimic these specific systems. The two parts merge. The central parts of the galaxies, sorry, they merge. Uh, again, we stop the computer simulation, change our perspective. And finally, here's a fifth pair of real galaxies going through this process. Now, this, these five pairs are part of something called the Tumre sequence. Alar and Yuri Tumre, brothers, uh, from originally from Estonia, came here and um, did the first computer simulations of colliding galaxies. They found these five pairs. The computer simulation you saw is a much more modern and uh, detailed simulation, of course. So, um, you might think, okay, galaxy collisions are great. What does that have to do with me? Why should I care? And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. Okay, so, why you should care has a lot to do with this galaxy over here. This is the Andromeda galaxy again. This is the full moon to scale. The full moon is, uh, is large. You can see it very clearly, but the full moon is bright. And Andromeda isn't, doesn't look this good to the naked eye because of its low brightness, low contrast against the sky. It's not its size. It's much bigger than the full moon in terms of angular size. It's much bigger than the full moon in real size, of course, but it's also <laughs> bigger than the full moon in angular size. So I've been part of this survey um, called um, FAT, PH. I, I'm not being derogatory to the PI over there. No, that's not, uh, uh, it's called the Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury. And Julianne Del Canton, who, who was a colleague of mine uh, when I was a grad student at Princeton, she started this survey at the University of Washington. A group of us at Santa Cruz work with her on this project. What you're going to see there is an, a, a white outline that um, represents the area that the Hubble telescope covered of Andromeda. Now, it took 828 orbits of Hubble around the Earth to collect those images. It collected about 3,000 images that were stitched together into a digital mosaic. It's the largest digital mosaic that Hubble has ever taken. And you know, what better place than to take a picture of part of the Andromeda galaxy? It's only a part of the Andromeda galaxy. This is special to me because, um, again, um, I, this Andromeda has been a love affair for me for many, many years. And I, my students and I were the first to take digital CCD mosaics of Andromeda. People had taken photographic plates, they had taken single images, but my students and I took the first digital image. We took 57 images back in 1990, and uh, some students of mine stitched the image together. But this is 3,000 images with a much better telescope, with the Hubble telescope. Let's see how good the telescope is. Let's take a look. So, um, there's the arc of the Milky Way across. There's Andromeda, the tiny speck, two and a half million light years away. But what we're going to do is we're going to zoom into Andromeda based on this Hubble image mosaic. So fasten your seat belts because we're going to zoom a long way. And um, these are all actual images of Andromeda. We're going to keep zooming, keep zooming, until you realize that Andromeda is made up of stars just like the Milky Way, the same you know, mix of colors that you saw in that earlier star field in Andromeda is right there in, uh, sorry, in the Milky Way is right there in Andromeda as well. Andromeda is very much our twin. You can see some dark patches. If you have good eyes, you can see dark patches. Those are clouds of gas and dust where Andromeda is being, uh, light of Andromeda stars uh, are being blocked, just like a cloud in the sky might block the light of the sun. Now, based on these images and based on other images taken with Hubble, we made a, a shocking discovery in 2012. So I told you, in 20, uh, you know, we discovered that Andromeda is five times bigger than people previously thought. That discovery was in 2005. In 2012, we were seven years later, we were part of another group that discovered that Andromeda was heading straight for us. So as they say, ast uh, astronomers wondered why Andromeda was getting bigger and bigger, and then it, <laughs> and then it hit us, you know? So, um, so, um, 
we dis for a long time, one of the three components of Andromeda's motion has been known. The Z component has been known. In 2012, we measured the X and Y components, and we are actually trying to refine that measurement uh, as we speak. But we really made the shocking discovery that Andromeda is coming to us, straight for us. So NASA uh, got very excited about all this. They said, you know, we have a limited amount of time because Andromeda is coming. So let's, <laughs> let's put together a little video to show what Andromeda is going to look like in the future. Because, you know, normally astronomy, you think about the past, but let's talk about the future. What is the future Milky Way Andromeda collision going to look like? So again, there's the Milky Way, there's Andromeda up there, this is what it looks like today. But let's see what the future brings. So this is today in a couple billion years, Andromeda, like I said, is going to be bigger. Um, you know, wait for three or four billion years, there's a spectacular collision with the Milky Way. Um, four billion years, it's a mess. Um, <laughs> five, six, um, you know, in, in six billion years, there's still separate entities. By seven, the two galaxies have merged into a new galaxy, who's, for which we already have a name. The sun won't uh, be there. The sun won't be there, that's right, but we'll cut, get to that in a minute. But this galaxy, this new galaxy already has a name. It's called Milcomeda because it's the Milky Way and Andromeda. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so NASA made a huge mistake in, um, in making this movie, right? The, in seven billion years, these rocks on the hillside have not weathered. So, uh, so, um, but you can see the collision is spectacular. I can bet we're going to stop celebrating the 4th of July because, you know, we'll have this long-lasting display of cosmic fireworks in the sky. But to really enjoy these fireworks, as you say, we have to, we have to do a bit of work. Uh, we have to make sure we survive a world controlled by crazy politicians. That's the first thing, we, the first order of business. You have to survive killer diseases, maybe the medical miracles around the corner. Because, you know, living for seven billion years is, you know, it, it's gonna take, take a lot. Uh, we have to survive the rapidly degrading environment. That's another challenge. And, uh, and as you said, the sun's gonna bloat up into a red giant, you know, in a, in a few billion years. It's gonna engulf the earth, so we have to escape outwards from the earth. No, no point escaping inwards, that's only gonna make it worse. We have to escape outwards. We have to go beyond Mars, because the, the sun's gonna engulf the earth, so we have to go beyond Mars, um, maybe to one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, and if we settle in there and not kill the place, like we're killing this place, uh, we can sit back and really watch these cosmic fireworks unfold. That'll be our reward for all the smartness it takes to get out there. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you.